It's long. Complete to number 71, Barwell. And he's brought down by Gilbert. Gord Barwell signed his first pro contract with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in 1964 at the age of 19. His good hands and great speed earned him a spot on a talent-laden rider team that included CFL Hall of Famers Ron Lancaster, Hugh Campbell, and George Reed. In 1966, Gord and his lovely wife Nancy enjoyed the thrill of winning the Grey Cup. In the years that followed, Barwell distinguished himself as one of the riders' top receivers, helping them gain berths in three more Grey Cup games. The highlight being his last cup appearance against the Hamilton Tigats in 1972. At the start of the 1974 season, Gord retired. He'd won a Grey Cup, was managing a successful clothing business, and had a fine family, which now included a son, Jay, and a daughter, Jody. But something was missing in Gord and Nancy's life. They uh, sought for happiness and peace and direction in a lot of ways in my life, and uh, discovering that after 10 years of pro football and being in four Grey Cups and all kinds of uh, uh, different awards our team won, being successful in business and uh, being the uh, local man about town and helping a lot with service clubs and different things. Uh, I, was, I just wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't fulfilled in, in a lot of things I did. I'd be f uh, fulfilled for a while, but an emptiness crept back into my life. It was about two months later that I was talking with Gary Lefebvre in an airport in Winnipeg, having been invited to a conference for Athletes in Action, along with my wife, and uh, it was there that I came face to face with the claims of Jesus Christ. I'd never heard them before. And down there the man said, if there's a void in your life and you've been trying to fill it for years, you can fill it forever with Jesus Christ. He'll come into your life and give you life that's full and meaningful. And down there, David, I just simply bowed my head and I surrendered my will and I said, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the living Son of God and I'm sorry for the life I've lived. I've lived it apart from you. I want you to come into my life, take control of me, and change me. And almost nine years ago, that day, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord heard my invitation and he came in and uh, he changed my life. He's completely revolutionized and changed my life. As Gord and Nancy grew in their faith, so did their desire to serve the Lord. In 1977, they left the business world to join the full-time staff of Athletes in Action. As the Eastern AIA director and later the Canadian director of Athletes in Action, God used Gore to impact many lives for Jesus Christ. It's, it's been a pleasure for me to see, I've been a Christian 12 years now, but uh, for me uh, to see almost 200 men and their wives come to know the Lord in Canada alone in the, uh, in the last 12 years, and then to, to uh, see them come into uh, discipleship programs and then to stand up and be counted, whether it be at a, a breakfast, a banquet, a prison, or a high school assembly. And uh, it's, uh, listen, I've been involved in it full time since it started in Canada. And I w I'd, I'm the happiest guy in the world. I'm doing exactly what I want to do, and I've got to work with a bunch of tremendous people in this ministry. Through chapel services and Bible studies with CFL players, Gord played a key role in both winning and building these men for Christ. Under Gord's direction, AIA built and entered a float in the 1978 Grey Cup Parade. The float featured Christians from each CFL team. In addition to the float, Gord was also instrumental in organizing AIA outreach breakfasts. Christian athletes shared their testimonies, while Gord often wove the program together with his masterful emceeing. Giving the athletes an opportunity to share their faith was an important part of Gord's job. As well as involving them at breakfasts and other speaking engagements, Gord and the pros traveled to numerous communities conducting evangelistic high school assemblies. Over the years, tens of thousands of high school students heard the gospel through these outreaches. You can't mention Gord Barwell without talking about his incredible sense of humor. Practical joker, king of the one-liner, clown. They all fit Gord. Uh, he would call me every now and then, about every two or three months, and uh, crazy sense of humor he had, and he'd call at me and say, Hey, you still a Christian? The only thing I didn't like about Gordy was he had four words that... Uh, used to scare me, and he'd have, oh, by the way. <laughs> We'd, he'd set up a banquet, get it all prepared. I'd go there with my wife, and I'd be sitting in the crowd, and he'd come up and he'd go, oh, by the way, do you mind being the guest speaker? The pranks are legend. 
there were more than a few. Shaving cream in my telephone, water in my shoe. <laughs> your crazy sense of humor, parsley up your nose, your endless puns and wit kept me on my toes. The thing that I admire most about him is the fact that he was evangelistic uh, in everything that he was doing. Gory was not evangelistic in the sense that he was always trying to beat you over the head with biblical principles, and he wasn't all serious all the time because one of his great attributes was to, to be humorous. And those who knew him best uh, know about all his puns and all about his little pranks that he would pull. But he was evangelistic in a sense that uh, he acted as a barometer for me, uh, an indication of perhaps how far I had strayed or how far I was from where I should be in, in sharing my faith with people. Uh, not in a, in a big rally where you have an opportunity to give a speech, but just in day-to-day -day contacts with uh, hotel clerks or waitresses or uh, uh, airline pilots uh, or even a, a student walking down the hall that perhaps wasn't coming to the AIA assembly, but uh, Gordy would drop a little uh, something into that 10-second conversation that would cause that person to come face-to-face -face with, uh, with who Jesus was and uh, where that person actually stood. So being evangelistic uh, probably will always be a, a challenge to me uh, as I re recall Gord uh, as a close friend uh, certainly affected me in other ways but as a as a spiritual mentor or someone who modeled uh, spiritual truths for me I would have to say that uh, Gordy Barwell uh, cared very much whether people became Christians and he lived that uh, each part of the day. The Apostle Paul, writing in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, says, For I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't and life can't. The angels won't and all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are, high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus Christ when he died for us. Uh, I love that scripture verse. I, I recall reading that as a baby Christian and, and thinking how great it would be to be so totally convinced as the Apostle Paul was that nothing would ever separate us from the love of God. To be so convinced to be so great. I've had a lot of people die in my lifetime and it's ripped me apart. I had a sister who was 17 years old, died of Hodgkin's disease. At her funeral, a pastor of a strange church came up to me. He told me that my sister had prayed and received Christ shortly before she died. That meant nothing to me at the time. I said, oh, great, until I became a Christian. And then I realized that I had a tremendous promise in the Word of God. My sister wasn't dead. She'd just gone to be with the Lord, and I was going to spend eternity with her because of what Jesus did for both of us. And I went running home with that news because my dad and my sister had been the closest of friends for years and years. And when my sister died, a big chunk of my father died. And I had to go to a sports banquet from up way up past Saskatoon. I picked that up, and for two and a half hours up and two and a half hours back, I told him all about the Lord and that Faye knew the Lord and all this good news. You know, my dad never argued a minute with me. Matter of fact, he kind of enjoyed what he heard. And over the course of the next year, year and a half, uh, we talked many times, gave dad many things to think about. And one night, I got a phone call, Dad had had a stroke. We rushed home from Regina to Saskatoon, and we got there, and all the way praying, God, let Dad be alive when we get there. And he was, but he was a, he was a vegetable. It was tough for me to see my father lying there in that condition. And shortly thereafter, Dad died. And I went home with Nancy and my mom, and walked into the bedroom, and the kids were just waking up. And Jody woke up at the time, our little eight-year-old, and she looked at us, and I guess you could tell from the tears that there was, the Grandpa had died, and she said, Grandpa's dead, isn't he? We said, yes, he just passed away a little while ago. She got a tear in her eye. And my little eight-year-old girl looked back at us and said, but just think, he's going to see Auntie Faye right now. I got a lump in my throat that was so big I couldn't swallow. And I turned around and I walked out of that bedroom. I said, Lord, thank you that my little eight-year-old girl has what it took me 29 years to discover. Thank you that my little eight-year-old girl is so convinced that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. 
And ladies and gentlemen, in the world we live in today, wouldn't it be great to be convinced? <laughs>